So I'm going to use the video lecture today to introduce a few topics in human geography that you'll also have in your textbook as well. Um, understanding a little bit of the spatiality of uneven development throughout the world, um, looking at globalization as a phenomenon. So I wanted to start off with this map which you saw last week as you were comparing uh, physical geography to where people tend to live in the world. This map shows um, the number of people per capita throughout the world, the darkest red colors being areas where there's more than a thousand people. And as you can see, it's an uneven distribution of folks throughout the world. Um, the biggest majorities of populations in China, India, um, and Europe. But we can keep in mind this notion of population as we go forward to look at uh, some of the indicators of development that people draw on to understand uh, the world economy. So this first map shows GDP per capita um, based on 2007 data. The darkest blue colors are uh, GDP of $30,000 or more. Um, as you go down into the cooler colors, those numbers decrease. Um, as you get into uh, the warmer colors again, you see very low GDP per capita. So in the yellow, you have um, people living on $2,000 to $3,500 a year. In the red, it's 0 to $500 a year. So huge amounts of difference across uh, different countries in the world in terms of GDP. Here's another way of looking at those um, income disparities. This map um, takes the shape of different countries and um, changes the size of those uh, shapes based on the amount that they're trying to represent. So you can kind of make out here that this is a sort of non-traditional view of the world, the United States, as the sort of uh, fat country there on the left side of the map. Um, the pink area is countries in Europe. And then um, can you guess what the um, shape on the far right hand side is in the purple? Uh, it's Japan showing up as um, having large incomes. Um, if you look really hard, you might notice uh, a little red bit trailing off the bottom of Europe, and that's the um, African continent as having a very low share of world GDP. One of the terms that you saw in your textbook was the term development. And I want to talk about that um, a bit today. Your book defines it as a progressive improvement of the human condition in both material and non-material ways. So we can think about this as a political, social, and economic project to try to improve people's well-being overall. But of course, with any such project, um, it's not quite as straightforward as that. There's many different interpretations of development and ways that it's put in action. We can also think about development as a way of analyzing social change that assesses the economic process of countries in an evolutionary sort of way. And when we think about things in an evolutionary sort of way, it often means uh, focusing on a specific trajectory that folks expect to be the same for various countries. And often when people uh, do this analysis, they focus specifically on incomes and pay little attention to other sorts of indicators. When we look at those maps earlier and think about the uneven development across the globe, there's a number of factors that come into play with this being the case. Um, to begin with, there's an uneven global distribution of natural resources and energy resources. So there might be a few countries that um, have very favorable distributions of these things and others that are at disadvantages. There's also political factors that will impact how a country uh, develops. Um, sometimes unfavorable conditions such as um, war, um, civil strife, corrupt governments, poor infrastructure can impede a country's ability um, to develop. 
We could also think about technology as a factor in terms of uh, changing people's quality of life, the ability to um, use different resources and um, to change the sort of amount of um, money and labor that's required to exploit these types of resources. And so as we look at uneven development, we can think about it as a systematic process of economic and social development that's uneven in space and time. And the idea of places that are developed and places that are underdeveloped are really two sides of the same coin. It's an integral part of capitalist development for some places to be underdeveloped. So some historic factors that are important in thinking about how the current state of world development has come to be. Um, a very important one is colonization. We can think about this as occurring from about 1500 in the Common Era to about 1950. Um, during this point in time, European countries took control over other territories um, throughout the world in order to mainly extract resources. This map illustrates some of that extraction of resources and some of these relationships. So Europeans were motivated by economic, uh, political, and religious reasons. Um, and also motivated by the idea that they had um, about themselves being superior to other folks throughout the world. So with this sort of project of colonialism, they moved into new locations, new locations to them, obviously not new to the uh, millions of folks living in these places, and um, transformed the local systems that existed there, um, often uh, destroying societies and uh, many lives in the process. If we look at this particular map, um, what we see here, and you have this book, uh, this map in your book as well, we see some of the flows of resources from areas that were colonized back to the um, colonizing countries in Europe. So um, things like profits from the use of slave labor in um, the Caribbean uh, going to Britain, uh, valued at approximately $1.3 billion. Um, profits from things like silver exports uh, to Spain and Portugal, valued at almost um, $1.5 uh, billion. So huge amounts of money that, uh, money, value, and labor that were taken from these former col uh, colonial uh, holdings back to Europe. And we can define colonialism as the establishment and maintenance of political and legal domination by a state over a separate and alien society. And there's numerous examples, uh, sort of the biggest example that one can draw on is the British Empire that was really in its heyday in the 1920s. Uh, at that point, folks would say the sun never set on the British Empire because they had holdings um, around the world. Another key historical factor to think about in terms of global development and is the rise of capitalism and with that of the nation state. This has occurred from about 1800 to 1980. And this really fueled further European expansion. So we can see in this first map um, during early colonial period, um, this is from about 1714, you have um, places in uh, South, uh, South America and Central America that have become colonial holdings for the Spanish and Portuguese. You have um, expansion of the Ottoman Empire into other parts of Southwest Asia. But overall, um, not a tremendous amount of um, 
imperial expansion. What really causes um, what really causes this to take off is the rise of capitalism from the 1800s to about 1980. This really was fueled by uh, industrialization and with industrialization came the need for resources, labor, and then markets for um, the producers to sell their goods to. Um, in the same time, you see the decline of monarchies and the growth of democratic states. So capitalism is really important for us to understand in terms of how the global economy functions today. We can think about it as a form of economic and social organization characterized by the profit motive and the control of the means of production, distribution, and exchange of goods by private ownership. And we talk about it as a form of economic and social organization because it permeates all aspects of um, people's lives. Um, how how we interact with each other, um, the idea of needing to own private property, um, things like that. It permeates how our government itself is organized. So we can see by 1914 this map of imperialism and colonialism has uh, gobbled up much more of the world. Um, we can see that Sub-Saharan Africa has been divided between European powers. Um, there has been some independence in um, Latin America, but we see that other areas of the world, including um, Southeast Asia, India, Australia, uh, Canada, um, are within the realm of colonial rule. Another important historical factor to understanding um, the spatiality of global development is the Cold War. And this happened from about 1945 to 1989, where the United States and the Soviet Union had established roles as opposing global superpowers. Rather than having a direct conflict between the two countries, um, there are many proxy conflicts in different parts of the world, um, such as uh, Vietnam, um, throughout Latin America, in Africa. And throughout the world, there were various countries that were a lot allied with either the United States or the Soviet Union and received favors um, from one or the other, depending on these alliances. And then there was many countries that also chose to be non aligned with either side. Now if we look at the Cold World, or sorry, the Cold War world then, we see uh, in blue the United States and um, its allies, and in red the Soviet Union and its allies. And there are, you can see some of the non-allied states in uh, the gray, and places where you see the dots are areas where there's um, opposition movements uh, funded by one side or the other, so places where um, there might have been conflict. Another factor that we need to take into account in understanding uneven development is uh, what we could consider the sort of post-industrial era. Um, from about the 1980s to the present, we see a change in the international division of labor, so where things are made throughout the world and by whom, and manufacturing moves from the United States and Europe to other regions of the world, um, especially to Asia. This chart illustrates some of that shift where we see percentage of world GDP in the last 500 years.